So, I'm going to be talking with Peter, Eliezer, and uh, Aubrey about basically how they've been thinking about this. Oh, so I'm going to be talking to Peter, Eliezer, and Aubrey about how they've been thinking about these issues for a long time. Hey, how long? So, when did you decide to save the world or change the world? Well, I, uh, in theory or in practice. So, um, I think, uh, you know, I think everybody, uh, when they're a kid and growing up, has an idea that they want to do something different, do something special, and I, I think, uh, and then I think uh, I started to act on it uh, when I became an entrepreneur in my late twenties. And that's, uh, but I think, uh, but I think, in, it, you know, I think the the real the real question we should be asking is um, why why do people give up on trying to change the world? Um, I'll, I'll second the, the, on, that on the proper form of the question. I mean, you know, once I realized that there was a problem, I don't think it ever occurred to me not to save the world. You, you know, I mean... Um, so so what, what point in my life... Um, it, it actually is a pretty difficult uh, question. I mean, there's the point where I, uh, where I sort of noticed the intelligence explosion possibility as the result of reading Werner Vinci and realized, well, there's all these people dying every day. That's 150,000 people per day. It's a depressing fact, and we should really change that fact. Um, and and there's, the, there, there's a later point where I realized, well, no, it's actually not just that. It's that you can actually screw up the singularity. It's very easy to screw up, and the entire human species stands at risk. And I don't, I, I, you know, can, I can sort of understand it in an abstract way, but ultimately not really sympathize with someone who can think that their world is going to die and do, 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 do. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, I, I have a pretty accurate, precise idea of when I came to the conclusion that I wanted to make a difference to the world and as big a difference as possible. And it was when I discovered that I was reluctant to practice the piano at the age of nine, as my mother wanted me to. Um, uh, essentially, uh, I wanted to understand why I was reluctant, and eventually I realized that the main reason was that the best possible outcome of my spending all this time practicing the piano would be that I would become a good pianist. And what the hell was the point of that? Because there's already plenty of other good pianists. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that, that was what led me to realize that I wanted to make as much of a difference as possible and, and to become a scientist and thereafter to move into artificial intelligence for humanitarian reasons and then after that to move into gerontology when I discovered to my absolute shock that most biologists didn't think that aging was very important or very interesting. Um, but again, I agree with Peter that the key thing is why do people stop thinking this way? And I think, unfortunately, the answer is very boring and very simple, namely, it's all about failure. The reason I've managed to maintain a, a, a will to aim high is ultimately because I've been aiming high for a long time and I've made modest but non-trivial progress in doing so, and, you know, it's, it's success that breeds success and breeds enthusiasm to carry on trying. I think it's ultimately all about, all about failure. But couldn't someone else do it? Wouldn't that be easier? In, in fact, they're not. <laughs> as, as the saying goes, um, someone's got to do something, and it's completely ridiculous that it has to be us. But there well, you go. Well, you know, it's, 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 like, the, it's like the joke about the uh, two uh, University of Chicago economists walking down the street where uh, one of them sees a $100 bill and the other one says, there can't be a $100 bill because there'd be an efficient market and people walking down the street picking up $100 bills. And, um, and so obviously... Uh, um, if everybody thought this was a serious problem, uh, it would be more likely that other people would be doing it. But if we're in a world where everybody thinks somebody else is going to be doing it, uh, it's much less likely that somebody else will be doing it. And unfortunately, we're more in that uh, second type of world than the first world. Yep. So Peter, I suppose um, you've made a career out of picking up $100 bills on the sidewalk. I once found a 20 once, but... Um, <laughs> Never actually found a hundred. My sister found a sapphire ring, but I think compared to Facebook, that's kind of lame. <laughs> well, I, 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 uh, I don't know. I, I found a twenty-dollar bill once. I haven't found a hundred-dollar bill yet. Um, it was actually uh, it was on an occasion where I was relaying this precise anecdote, so it was kind of cool. But um, uh, no, I, I think that uh, I think that you know the question of what areas people should focus on and should focus their energies on in terms of where to contribute. It's, I think, 
uh, there is something to be said for trying to avoid doing things that too many other people are doing. And, uh, you know, the, the word ape simultaneously means primate and to imitate. And, um, and, um, and there is something about, I think, very deep about human nature that's social and imitative and sort of, um, um, and there are ways in which that's good and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of good that comes out of that. But I think that, uh, that in terms of uh, this question of where one can really push the envelope and make a difference, it's, it's important to explore areas that people are not doing. And I think uh, it's cer certainly true of anti-aging, artificial intelligence, just about all the topics that are being discussed here, far too few people are doing. And therefore, um, I think these are areas where there's tremendous scope for uh, people to make a difference in many different ways. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to amplify on that in, in particularly the context of science, though it probably does apply more broadly. I think, no, it, it's always appalled me that really, really bright scientists almost all work in the most competitive fields, the ones in which they are making the least difference. In other words, the ones in which if they were hit by a truck, then, you know, the same discovery would be made by somebody else about 10 minutes later. Um, <laughs> I, I, I absolutely never understood that. The only sort of proto-explanation that I've ever really thought of is that it's a function of the way that we're educated, especially the way that boys tend to be educated, which places too much emphasis on competition and on getting people to be wistful for competition if they're not competing with the people that they perceive to be the other bright people. There's, there, oh, sorry. Go ahead, that's There's no efficient market in utilons, is the way I sometimes put it, um, where that's from utility and, the, um, you know, it goes back to the birds example. Markets may not be perfectly efficient. They generally tend to be difficult to exploit, but that doesn't mean they're sane. But even so, there's no investment class where you know what the payoff is. The payoff is 100 times as much, it's a, and, the, and the price goes from $80, from $80 to $88. There's no efficient market in utilons. And part of that uh, is reflected in the entire neglect of the notion of marginal effort. The, the less attention something is getting, the easier it is for marginal efforts to make a difference. Um, and what you actually have is, if I may be permitted a bit of Hansonian cynicism, status affiliation, where you congregate where the people who have the most status already are, and by giving to that uh, organization, you affiliate yourself with them, and so the large ones have the highest status already, you give more to them, you affiliate with a larger group of higher status people, and the, the actual object of the philanthropy, the people you're supposed to be helping, the goal you're trying to, be, trying to accomplish, um, especially if you dare to compare these projects. Okay, I mean, I don't want cute puppies to die, but I, a little less money to puppy pounds and a little more money to existential risk prevention would probably be a good decision on humanity's part, even if it tugs at our heartstrings. So if you hadn't ended up on aging, and if you hadn't ended up on AI, what do you think you would have ended up on? What might be some other places to look for low-hanging fruit, places where people aren't looking for uh, high impact, high payoffs? Well, that's, that's particularly hard for me to answer because before I was in aging, I was working in AI. And so I, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to think about anything else. I've been too busy. Um, I'm not really sure, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it seems sort of obvious that those are by far the hardest, the worst problems that humanity has. But I guess I'd probably be working on some sort of existential risk thing. Um, I'd probably be uh, uh, human, something in human rationality, uh, or, or possibly would have ended up as a uh, science fiction author. But I have to remind myself that it's not what's the most fun to do. It's not even what you have talent to do. It's what you need to do that you ought to be doing. And do you want to talk about Patrick Friedman, who's the one who's missing from this table? <laughs> well, I don't know. There's sort of, there, I think there are, there are many different things uh, that, uh, that um, one could be, one could be uh, developing. I think, you know, I, I do think that sort of as a, as a default, I would, I would, if you had, wanted to have a menu, I would just give you the list of science fiction books from the 50s and 60s and go through those as starting points. So development of the oceans, development of the deserts, development of outer space, um, robots, um, nanotech, biotech, AI, 
you, you sort of go through the, the menu, and that's, that's probably about a, as good a place to start as any. Um, but I think, you know, I think, I think the, the, the thing that I, I, I very much uh, agree with uh, both um, Aubrey and Eliezer on is that uh, there is something about the, um, the problem of the way status is measure, measured in our society. There's something about uh, competition that's, uh, that's extremely, um, it, it's good up to a certain point, but then it, it goes very, very badly wrong. And I can sort of, sort of as a, you know, autobiographical version of this where, you know, it's super tracked. I was like competitive chess player in, in high school. It was actually, in a way, one of the things that was, was good that uh, the computers got better than the humans at chess. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, I realized this was perhaps not the best thing to be doing. Um, but I, I think that uh, there are sort of all these directions people, people get tracked into and, you know, we should somehow discourage that. The, 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 the air, sort of my my uh, pet peeve of where too many smart, there are too many smart people, in my opinion, who are in physics in our society, and I think it's, um, and that's I think sort of a symptom of uh, the fact that uh, people can excel at a very early age at things like music or chess or math or physics, and the competitive thing then ends up tracking people towards those fields rather than to fields where it maybe takes a little bit longer to build up the skill set, but ultimately much bigger contribution could be made, and so that's. Uh, if we could, um, if we could, could get all the super string theorists to work on anti-aging or AI, they get to choose one or the other. Um, I, I think we make incredible progress. Yeah, I, I've quipped that if one of the, if we had Ed Witten got AIDS, we'd have a cure within a few years. Um, <laughs> now, a funny thing is, a funny thing is, as Eliezer pointed out, people are, seem to be heavily motivated to affiliate with high-status individuals. And yet, Peter, you were playing chess, which was a, uh, a lot of work, I imagine, and probably wouldn't have ended up leading you to affiliating with as high-status individuals as has actually worked out to be the case. And I think that's kind of the true, even with Eliezer and Aubrey, you're, uh, you've actually ended up being able to affiliate with pretty high-status individuals, too. So it seems like the apparent cost isn't as great as it turned out to be. Any other tips for affiliating with high-status individuals? <laughs> Make a difference. Um, it's well, I, look, I, I, yeah. st st status, status is very overrated. And so if you want, it's one of these things where if you want it, you will not actually get it. So if you want to start a successful company, it, you do it because you're passionate about something. But if you try to, the people who try to make money generally don't make money. If you want to become a famous author, and you're becoming a writer just to become famous, you won't succeed because actually writing is incredibly isolating and lonely as a process. And so I think, um, and so I tend to think there is something about status which is that uh, you're most likely to achieve it if you don't actually want it. And uh, this is, you know, it's sort of, we see this in sort of all these paradoxes where, you know, people don't want to join a club that wants to have them as a member, and so there are all these sort of weird paradoxes associated with it. Um, and the way I would short circuit it is by just saying that um, you should just try to not focus much less on these status questions because they ultimately are sort of much less productive than people think. Your, your desire for status, I mean, it might have worked fine in the ancestral environment. Today, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just rolling dice. You know, your, your intuitions could lead you anywhere. They could lead you to invest with Bernie Madoff, who, um, you know, made his money off of. Uh, giving the impression that only high-status people were allowed to invest in his company. And, you know, there's so many different people trying to exploit that nowadays that if you, you know, if you actually pay attention to those instincts, you're just going to be led straight off a cliff by someone who's making a profit on it, too. Okay. Um, another thing, of course, is that, well, I think we can fairly say that we're all, Peter maybe somewhat less so, not too afraid of being weird. What rules does one have to break? <laughs> in order to be, uh, what rules does one have to break in order to be uh, high impact, to make a uh, real impact in the world? Well, you, you, <laughs> you've, you've got to uh, break the rule about caring what other people think. I mean, you can pretend to care about thinking what people think, and you can be the sort of person who doesn't really care, but, you know, has learned to take it into account as a conscious consideration, but if you're actually paying attention on some 
and it's not so much when paying attention is the wrong term. If there's that sort of deep start of fear inside you, when you see someone else, we see that other people are thinking something different or saying something different. If there's that deep start of fear, you're probably in a lot of trouble. If you're making, you know, this, and if you've learned to make the sort of abstract consideration of it, then, then you may be okay. But that, that sort of, what on earth am I doing? Is there someone watching me? Um, that, that you have to squash that instinct within yourself. Yeah, not caring what other people think is certainly important. I think caring what you yourself think is important. Being good at introspection, being good at understanding uh, and, and uh, gravitating to a self-consistent understanding of your own values, because that helps to intensify those values and, and maintain one's confidence when one might be in, challenging, in you know, socially challenging situations. I think that comes, that's a large part of it. And, and if you try to be as weird as I am, you're probably trying too hard or setting your standards <laughs> too high or something. Yeah, you, 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 you um, want to try to avoid being conformist, but that also means avoiding conforming to the prevailing standards of nonconformity. And so it's, it's sort of, you have, you have layers and layers of things. So it's, again, I think, uh, I think I would short circuit, you know, do you think I had one step, two steps, three steps, four steps, five steps? You can short circuit all of them by just uh, trying to think. Yes, I, I call that the, the outside the box box. Whenever someone tells you to think outside the box, they will conveniently show you for your convenience where the outside the box is located. <laughs> and um, I, I believe this is a major uh, problem with venture capital where you know, you know, they're all thinking in the same outside the box box. <laughs> Except for Peter Thiel who actually does <laughs> think outside the box. Oh. Now, Eliezer, you mentioned being afraid of being different. I'm wondering, do you think that, do you find that fear in general or any other emotions might in general just be harmful? Is there any types of motivations that you would think of as worth cultivating? Any, especially with, in general, about emotions. You tend to emphasize that rational does not mean spark. Yes. Um, it, it, you know, try to feel the emotion that fits the facts. Um, calm is sometimes the wrong emotion to fit the facts. Um, but to answer your particular question, I would say that the um, love and enjoyment of exercising power over others is in, you know, I, I can't speak for everyone, but, you know, you, you know I've, I've, I've sort of seen, that, I saw that once within my mind and went like, yeah, squish, because I knew that was evil. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the sorts of emotions that are good are the sorts of emotions that intensify one's conviction to try to carry on making a difference in the world. And those are, by and large, for me anyway, the positive emotions rather than the negative ones. You know, I, um, I, I have the same re positive emotions that regular people have, and, and they intensify my love of being alive and my love of wanting other people to be alive. And so those are really the sorts of things that matter most. I think negative emotions tend to be more confusing than clarifying. And, if I can ask, oh, were you sorry? Well, uh, my, my very short version of this is I think, uh, I think things that sort of emotionally center you so that you can, um, you can uh, persevere on things that don't seem, you know, don't seem to be socially acceptable or desirable are, I think, quite, quite important. And so, uh, you know, uh, having some way where you don't get depressed if things aren't going the right way day to day is probably really important because, you know, life is very long and we hope that it is quite a bit longer than very long in some cases. So, so I, I think that we actually uh, all agree on a number of things that we should probably ex discuss explicitly. So if I can ask Peter a question. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so I know what it's like on my end when I'm sort of talking to people and trying to get them to take action on existential risks. But in, in your end, on, on, and in the circles you move, and I'm kind of curious as to what the experience is like on, on, on your end, like, uh, how do people excuse ignoring these things, for example? Well, for the most part, well, it varies in different contexts, but uh, for the most part, uh, they end up having way more clutter in their lives, and the effect of it is that uh, it's actually much easier for them to ignore it. And so, um, and so I think, you know, I think one of the things that uh, is something to be very careful of and guard against uh, is that uh, if you're successful by various metrics of how that's defined, is not to get trapped in a circumstance where 
you can no longer think originally, act freely, and, and thereby um, you sort of end up in these circumstances that, uh, that make it actually harder to replicate what made you successful in the first place. So I think, I think that tends to be a very psychosocial type of a pattern, even though in theory there should be sort of way more information in practice, uh, there's often just way more clutter. Uh, if it wouldn't be too rude, I'd love if, if you would elaborate on that, but I think probably asking for examples might be too much. <laughs> but you're doing it anyway. No, no, I, I'm, I'm giving the option. <laughs> well, you know, I, th I think the, uh, well, just to key off an example we've already cited, um, I think uh, the quest, you know, one of the, one of the questions is, uh, if you've made money, what nonprofits do you give the money to? Or do you, you know, assume you want to give some money towards something of a philanthropic purpose. Um, and uh, it is extraordinary, um, you know, how many pushy people there are advancing various nonprofit causes. And the, uh, the um, dog pound people, or people like that, you know, very sharp elbows, they're extremely rude. It's such a good cause. And, um, and the compound effect of that is, is really quite extraordinary. And so I think, I think that's, that's probably, um, an example where I think uh, the misallocation of uh, resources is extraordinary. I mean, I think in the for-profit case, there's sort of a lot of things that are misprioritized. Uh, Non-profit, things are measured less well. It's uh, misprioritized, in my mind, far worse. Uh, I, f I find a lot of it to be just weirdly boring. So, you know, most uh, charity dinners, you have just one boring speech after another, and people sort of think they're, they can get away with it because they're doing something good and, uh, and make you suffer through a whole evening of utter boredom. Um, but, um, but anyway, that's, that's a context where I think uh, it, it happens uh, to an unbelievable degree. Do we have any ideas about fixing this? I mean, I, I've been trying to brute force it by actually explaining cognitive biases to, to people and actually trying to fix what I perceive to be the underlying problems in uh, in the thought processes, but I'm wondering if anyone has any other approaches to fixing that. Yeah, embarrassing people helps. Um, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but I think Peter's put his finger on it in that uh, for the most important causes that people are most in denial about, um, and even embarrassing people is really hard. <laughs> you know, people are just willing to make complete fools of themselves in respect of their logical ability. Um, in, in, in analyzing these really important problems and the importance of them, um, and are willing to you know, gravitate to the most absurd knee-jerk reactions. I mean, of course, we're all familiar with the sorts of things that are said in favor of aging, um, uh, and I'm sure Eliezer has the same sorts of experience. It's very strange. Yeah, I, I probably bias a little bit too heavily towards trying to explain this to people as well, and I'm never sure that's quite uh, the the right mode because uh, there's so many uh, different social, social and psychological reasons that people are, are blocked from thinking about it. But that, that is my bias, is to try to just pound on this is what's really important, this is why it matters. Uh, trying to connect it to other issues I think is, is, is fairly important uh, mm -hmm. so that if, you know, if this problem doesn't get fixed, other problems will arise. There's a way in which your common sense views on the world are predicated in all these other things. So you try to, you try to just uh, come up with different, different cuts at it. Repeating yourself a lot helps as well. Just giving a ridiculous number of talks and a ridiculous number of interviews and so on, which is obviously what I do. <laughs> it makes things more true. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so if you don't think you maybe should explain things so much, what other approaches might you take? Have you t tried any other approaches? Well, I, no, I, th I think I, the, my bias is towards explaining things. Uh, my bi the, I think there's, you know, there's obviously a degree to which um, trying to just implement things directly and just unilaterally do things is, uh, is, is of some value. So it's like, you know, um, do you um, try to convince people to start technology companies? Do you start them yourself? You know, do you try to, um, and I, I, think, I think there is, there is something to be said for, um, uh, you know, there's obviously a degree which you don't want to just talk about things, you want to actually do them. So I think some combination of that. 
interested in... I, well, we can, we can go to Q&A. Oh, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> now, I'd especially like to ask if members of the audience have any other approaches than explaining that you might want to suggest. I'd be happy to hear, especially if we've got some concerns that it might... So, so, so we're taking comments as well as questions? I'd be happy to take comments as well as questions. I'm actually curious. This well, boy, well, idea of explaining people. being a bad yeah. idea... Yeah. Yeah. Well, of, Sean's looking worried already. <laughs> <right. laughs> All right, you first. Yeah, I have a quick question. You all seem to want to change the world in some way, like you have some vision of what the world should be like versus what it's like now. What would you say that is for each of you? And, and do you think that, you know, that it's quantifiably better than the way the world is now, and why? Anyone? Aubrey? <laughs> I didn't quite hear the, the question, actually. Well, yeah, I didn't hear the last part of the question, either. Sorry, I think you were saying, how, what would the world be like if it, for it to be better? Um, what would the world be like? Oh, uh, I could go on about this for, for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, instead of Eliezer going on for weeks, why don't I just answer instead? I'll, I'll take three seconds. Um, I think it's a subjective decision, and that's okay. If... if um, if people stopped dying all the time and actually had time to learn from their mistakes without dying of them, and, uh, well, actually, that in itself would, would, fix, would tend to fix a whole lot of problems over time. So I think I'll just go with that one instead of the other 300 edits. I'll go with, I'll go with that one, too. All right, one last question. Okay, so it's kind of a I we question. My background is in film and entertainment in the record business, and... I'm thinking in terms of everybody here who's watching the football games that you mentioned. I see billions of dollars going into entertainment and sports and all these other things. How can we make what we're doing, the singularity movement, rele relevant to the common man so that we can get those billions of dollars going into this? Got it. Aubrey, you want billions of dollars. Elias only wants millions, so you go. I'll take millions for the moment. Uh, um, uh, um, what can we do? Well, yeah, m getting people to identify with it is, of course, very important. The reason we started the Methuselah Mouse Prize back in 2003 was because a lot of people identify with prizes and world records and so on much, e much more easily than they do with dry scientific arguments. Um, and in general, you know, finding new, new tricks like that, tricks to get people interested, get, get, to get to build communities, um, yeah, we ought to do a great deal more, I think, in this space uh, in social networks, you know, to get to build up more interest in, at Facebook and Twitter and all those places like that. And certainly in the Sense Foundation, we're going to be doing that over the next short while. Um, you know, de generally just getting people to be less scared, less embarrassed about even thinking about these things, let alone thinking about them rationally. All right, you know, I, I, think, I think if we could get, if we could, if we could get a few... Uh, celebrities who have who clearly have a high IQ to um, to um, to uh, and the, or the few celebrities who have a high IQ or whatever uh, however we want to sequence that sentence uh, to uh, to get involved in this that might be very helpful. Great. No, it's over. I'm sorry. That was the last oh, so question. You know, I, I hate to take uh, advantage of the situation, but I know some celebrities. Maybe we could situation as well. No, it's true. George, George does know some celebrities, so he's quite right. My email public information. We can talk later. Okay, thank you.